<sighs> Hello, audience. There's my camera pointed. There it is. Here I am. Hello, audience. Um, we're going to hang on for just a minute here. We're going to make sure that uh, we... We are open, so I just went and I told all the folks out on the exhibit floor that we're going to be doing this presentation. So, got a couple here already hanging out. Um, but I'm going to give them a couple minutes to see if anybody else fills in before we get started here. And I guess for. The stream audience, sort of the prelude to this, is that we have a partnership that we're doing here where we are, the Science Center is talking about fish and fishing in Minnesota. Um, and so as part of that, it's a, it's a grant we're doing, we're uh, I'm going to be, over the next several weeks, so I'm probably going to be doing one of these shows in sort of a similar vein every Saturday for the next little while. And uh, at least for the first handful here, basically what I'm going to be doing is highlighting different fish or groups of fishes in Minnesota. Um, and as you can see by the presentation that's on the screen right now, today what we're talking about is a group called the True Sunfish. Try not to cast too big of a shadow over my over my space here. We'll go we'll go at ten thirty. CSP. Going out for another minute or so here and see what we get. Kind of a slow one today, as far as a, a Saturday morning goes at HSC. Not a whole lot of it. Not as many people here as normal. Which is okay. A slow one every now and then is fine. Especially coming into field trip season. We're going to get really busy really soon here. Adjust my sound just a smidge there. finish my coffee before I even start. But okay. Spoke too soon. Still 1029. We're nothing if not punctual here at HSC. Ah, 1030. Okay, so let's get started. So, like I said, this is a partnership that we're doing with uh, the Audubon Society. And I know the Audubon Society is, you know, mostly associated with birds, but they do all sorts of like outdoorsy sort of wildlifey stuff. And so we have a grant with them where we are supposed to talk about fish and like education around fish and particularly fishing. Um, and a lot of places that are sort of into like ecology and sort of naturalist stuff really like getting people involved with something like fishing sort of counterintuitively because, you know, obviously inherently with fishing, you're doing some harm to the fish you know, whether or not you're, whether you're just sport fishing or whether you're eating them. So it seems sort of counterintuitive to sort of encourage people to be going out fishing if like ecology is your goal. But like what we've found basically is that like the best way to get people invested in like protecting the nature around them is to do activities out in nature. And so fishing is one of those things that obviously, especially in Minnesota, gets a lot of people mobilized and out into nature and fosters like a grander appreciation of nature. And so the goal of doing something like this and sort of encouraging people to go out fishing and whatnot is to, like I said, encourage a greater appreciation for nature so people will be more apt to um, want to protect Minnesota waters. And I guess not just Minnesota waters, especially since we're live streaming here and I'm sure some of our audience here isn't in Minnesota, but the local waters, wherever you're at, take an active role in protecting them. And so today what we're talking about and as I said, we'll probably be talking about for the next several Saturdays in a row are just taking and highlighting some of the different species of fish that one will probably encounter while going out fishing in Minnesota. 
And I think the route we're going to go with this is we're probably going to start with the thing you're probably the most likely to bump into when you, you know, cast a line anywhere in Minnesota, and we're going to work our way into the more and more obscure over a while. So starting as basic as it gets here with the, of course, true sunfishes. And these are fish that, like, if you've spent any time fishing, you've encountered these guys. Like, for most of us here, this is one of these fish was probably the first fish we ever caught. Because these are the guys where, like, you take a worm in a bobber and you throw it off the dock. These are the guys you're catching. And so, in Minnesota, the three species that most prominently are representing this are the bluegill, the pumpkin seed. I grew up just calling these guys sunfish, um, but actual name for them is a pumpkin seed. And then these guys are called the green sunfish, probably the least common of the three that you'll encounter. And so let's get a little bit of a profile on these guys. So some things that are common throughout all of them. Um, physically, um, they're pretty small. And so like I said, these are the fish that you're gonna catch with your you know, two pound test line, throwing a bobber and a worm off the dock. And so they tend to uh, uh, be relatively small. These guys are feeding on pretty small food. Um, they have these sort of round bodies and this is sort of the, the, the term panfish is a term you'll hear get thrown around for a lot of different species in Minnesota. Um, and I guess in my experience is oftentimes more associated with like size, but like really what panfish is supposed to imply is actually sort of a shape. And so these guys have pan shaped bodies and so they get called panfish. Um, and then one common trait where you know you're dealing with one of these guys is they all have like a pretty dark spot on the gill plate that you can see right there. And there's little differences in the way the spot works, but basically they all have that spot. Um, the other thing that, again, anyone who's fished for these guys knows is they have very pokey, like, dorsal fins, the fin on the back. And we'll go back to our here, and you can see on the illustrations we have here, they have kind of one extended dorsal fin, but it's sort of broken up into two parts. One part that is, like, kind of pokey-ish, and then a little bit that is sort of more softer rays on it. That's something they all have in common. I'm sure we've all, any of us who have caught one of these guys before has had that experience of like trying to pick it up when you're taking the hook off or trying to get it off your line or whatever and getting poked in the hand by the dorsal fin and having whatever grown up was with you say, no, you got to hold it like this. And they, you know, grab it by the head first and slide backwards. So you push the fin down. That's a, as probably universal of Minnesota experience as you can get. Um, behavior wise, um, again, most of the diet is going to be very small things. Uh, a lot of aquatic invertebrates, these guys are going, uh, and eating a lot of like insect larvae, um, some, uh, like shellfish, so things like snails, uh, some smaller clams and things like that. Um, bluegills especially really like to eat all the various types of like planktons that we get here in Minnesota. Um, and uh, they tend to hang out in pretty shallow water, especially in the summer, um, because one, it's a good spot to be as far as like avoiding larger fish that would maybe want to prey upon them. It also tends to be where, like I said, like insect larvae are existing. Um, there also tends to be more plant matter, more weeds to hide in basically if you are in the shallows and these guys tend to like to spend a lot of the time in or near vegetation areas. Um, another thing that's pretty common with these guys is they they all are spawning at about the same time in the same place basically so it's very very common to find hybrids of these guys and so one of the tricky parts about like identifying these guys a lot of the time is that a lot of them aren't like you know the purebred versions of them you'll see you know mixes a lot because like I said they're spawning at the same time in the same places using very similar spawning practices and so like I said you tend to encounter a lot of hybrids of these guys. Alright let's start with the bluegill. Bluegill is probably the most famous one of these probably the one you're going to encounter the most here around in Minnesota especially like I said when you're talking about fishing um, and so the so our profile on these guys is like, even though we talk about this as being a group of fish that is like small, the bluegills are the biggest of the bunch. 
And so they tend to be the ones that you're going to encounter more out in like open water, especially like larger ones. The little ones still, you know, hang out in the shallows by the weeds all the time. But once they start getting into that like pound range, they start spending a lot more of their time sort of out in more open water. Because like I said, these guys are feeding a lot on things like plankton and that tend to exist more out in open water. And uh, I don't know if the the audience or the stream audience can hear this, but we just had an interesting murmuring from the audience of what is plankton. Uh, plankton is a great question. Uh, plankton are any type of animal that um, doesn't move under its own power. They are animals that uh, get pushed around by currents, basically. Um, so typically it's a thing you associate with like aquatic stuff. So like whales eat a lot of plankton, for example. So like when you see these big, uh, what we call baleen whales, the, like things like blue whales eating, they just like basically are swimming around with their mouth open a lot of the time. Um, what they're getting out of the water is stuff like plankton. Um, and so bluegills also eat a lot of plankton. So one of the limiting factors that all these fish have in common with one another is they have pretty small mouths, um, which e like even for their body size, they're small fish, but even for their body size, they have pretty small mouths, which tends to limit what they can have as their diet. Um, and so the bluegills, like I said, despite being the biggest of the batch, tend to eat some of the smallest stuff because they have this having a very tiny mouth issue. And so they tend to uh, feed a lot on plankton. And uh, Basically, in the summer, you're going to find them mostly in the shallows, especially the smaller ones. Um, we said state record, 2 pounds, 13 ounces, which, you know, almost 3 pounds is gigantic, but it's the state record. What do you expect? Um, and then as far as, like, actually angling for these guys, um, like I said, they're not picky, um, but they're limited by mouth size. Um, and so you can kind of throw whatever on the end of a hook and throw it off a dock and probably catch some bluegills. Like, I've caught them on bear hooks before. Um, but, you know, the worm, you know, your night crawler or, you know, your garden variety, you know, earthworm is sort of the stereotypical thing that you use. You could use things like wax worms if you want to go to the store and buy something. Uh, corn is something that I know, especially for kids, a lot of people use because they don't want to, you know, be touching the worms and stuff like that. Um, well, like I said, I've literally caught them on a bear hook before. And again, one of these things that you'll probably experience if you ever do go fishing for these guys is you'll throw like a hook and bobber out there and you'll find them like even trying to like nibble on your bobber. They can't get it down because again, their mouth is so small, but these guys are sort of notable for being like curious is what a lot of people will describe them as where like, I remember as a kid, like taking like clumps of sand from the beach and like throwing them in the water and watching the bluegills like run up and bite on them. Um, and watching like the, the sand particles like come out the back of their gill plates after they would bite them. Like I remember doing that as a kid. So like I said, not picky eaters, not hard fish to catch if you are, uh, you know, put anything on a hook and they'll probably at least come and check it out. Um, they like to hang out near vegetation. They like flat areas, especially, um, especially in the spring and summer when they're spawning, that's where they'll come in and uh, do their spawning and I guess go back a couple pages here. I didn't, didn't highlight our photo here. And so what you're seeing here are a collection of uh, bluegill nests. And so again, something where, you know, you go to the end of the dock, you know, early summer, and you'll see almost this like honeycomb pattern all over the bottom a lot of the time. And what those are are the nests of bluegills and pumpkin seeds mostly. So that's a big part of the reason why they're in the shallows when we tend to be fishing for them in the summer is because they're there to spawn. And uh, interestingly, it's the males that make the nest. So the males sort of make those circles and then we'll sit there and sort of guard them and sort of try and court a female to come in and lay eggs in their nest is generally the way it works. Um, so the ones you see sitting on the nests are actually the males. Um, and the males tend to be smaller as well. And so that's part of the reason why, like, the, the, the females tend to be more the ones that are out in open water more because they're bigger. Um, and the males tend to be more hanging out in the shallows because they're guarding the nest and also they're smaller and have to worry about predators out there. Um, the one thing that's kind of unique about bluegills is they're actually kind of sort of, they're, they're the one of these fish that you can actually catch relatively reliably in the winter. I mean, they... Uh, You'll, you'll snag a pumpkin seed or a green sunfish every now and then, but like, I know people who actually like 
go out fishing for bluegills in the winter and are able to be successful in it in a way that you tend not to really see with the others here. Um, but they tend to be hanging out in deeper water in the winter. Um, and basically the, the running theme with these guys is like wherever the insect larvae are at that time of the year, like that's where the bluegills are too. And so even when you're uh, fishing for them in the winter, you know, you're still looking for areas with flat bottoms. You're still looking for areas that have some relatively nearby vegetation. It's just in a little bit deeper water because it's a little bit warmer down there. Um, they tend to hang out in areas where the water is like 70-ish degrees is about what they tend to shoot for. Um, so they move into a little bit deeper water in the winter because it's a little bit warmer in the winter. In the winter, those like 20... 25-ish foot areas tend to be the warmest areas and uh, so that's where the insect larvae are. There's still some plants down there for them to hang out in and so if you're fishing for them, jig off the bottom. You'll, you know, if you got a small enough hook, like I said, you'll probably be successful if you're in the right area because they're still not picky. They're still pretty active eaters in the winter and that's something you see with a lot of fish is that their predation in general really slows down in the winter. Fish are, of course, cold-blooded. Um, which means that they are, uh, their metabolism is tied to the temperature of the environment around them. And so when they cool down, they tend to eat less. Uh, bluegills seemingly are, maintain their, their eating schedule more than most other types of fish do. So, like I said, you can still be pretty successful trying to fish for them in the winter. Alright. Uh, let's actually go back. Echopyrus. I was going to look at the Latin name for him. And so I think Macrochyrus is like a big plate or something like that, um, which is a reference to the gill plate. Like I said, we talked about how all of them have these. Um, spots on their gill plates that is sort of a identifying feature for them and you can see that in the the latin name for bluegill references the the gill plate for you know big like i said it's like kyrus is like plate or shield or something like that and that macro of course is big uh pumpkin seeds so probably the next most common one that you're going to encounter uh Again, tossing a bobber off the dock is the pumpkin seed. Um, they're quite a bit smaller than bluegills is sort of one of the big differences here. As you can see, the state record one, we said for the bluegill, the state record was, what was it, 2 pounds, 13 ounces or something like that, whereas this is less than half the size for the state record. Um, it was surprising to me, actually. I wouldn't have guessed it was that big of a difference. But, you know, I you know remember making this association growing up that pumpkin seeds were like smaller bluegills, basically. Um, and they're, of course, most easily identified by, you know, how vibrant their coloration is. You can see it in the photo here, the sort of blue stripes they have on their cheeks and the sort of blue fleckling they have throughout, and the nice bright orange belly. Um, again, you can see the spines on the back. They still have that. Um, you can still see the spot on the gill plate. The thing that, like, really differentiates, like, if you're, if you're really trying to tell the difference between, like, hey, does this have some pumpkin seed in it? One of the things you'll notice is that they have this like reddish or orangish rim around the spot on their gill plate that the other ones don't have. Um, so whenever I'm like kind of questioning, like, eh, is this a pumpkin seed? Is this a hybrid pumpkin seed thing? That's usually the thing I'm looking for is that rim on the gill plate. Um, you'll find them in a lot of the same areas. You find bluegills pretty much throughout the year. Big difference is they pretty much never go out in open water because like I said they're not big enough for it. Um, they have a little bit different type of teeth than bluegills have, and so these guys tend to prey way more heavily on like stuff that has hard shells, like snails and clams. We mentioned that um, the bluegills and stuff will eat that type of stuff too, but these guys really specialize in that. And again, part of that is you know suits them well because they are not leaving the shallows very often, um, other than in the winter when they kind of get forced to because the areas they live in probably freeze to the bottom or near to it. Um, they tend to be a little bit pickier as far as like what they'll just like throw in their mouth, basically. Um, as I said, you'll get that phenomenon with bluegills where like you throw a bobber in the water and the bluegills are like trying to get your bobber even. These guys are not quite that 
curious. They're not quite that um, easy to tease into eating. Again, still not hard, but they won't just run up on any old thing that hits the water and try and put it in their mouth in the way that bluegills a lot of the time seemingly are willing to do. Um, and again, you'll find them tied much more closely to vegetation than you do things like bluegills. Um, so they'll um, very rarely get more than like a few feet away from their vegetation that they're hanging out in. And so if you're fishing for these guys, again, off the dock, like, you know, you see that patch of weeds off to the side of the dock, throw your bobber over there, they'll come out and they'll grab it. But if you're just casting straight out into no man's land out there, you're much more likely to bump into a bluegill or a rock bass or something like that out there than you are a pumpkin seed. Alright, and finally the green sunfish. So this is probably the one that you're least likely to encounter. Um, just kind of throwing a bobber in wherever in Minnesota. Um, they are the smallest one of the three. They're not a whole lot smaller than the pumpkin seeds, but they are, you know, you can see the state record is a little bit smaller. Um, and the standout thing for them is that they are a lot less vibrantly colored than the others. Um, still have a spot on the gill plate. You can see, and I guess the one in the picture here even has a little bit of that like yellowish orangish around the perimeter there. Um, but you can see very similar type of pattern to like what the pumpkin seed has with the blue stripes on the cheek and the blue flecking and the orange belly that they all share in common. Again, you're seeing the spiky, spiky back there. Um, the big thing that's like different about them is they have a little bit bigger mouth than the others. They have almost a mouth that's a little bit more similar to like a bass or a crappie mouth. Um, and what that allows them to do is like actually like chase down and eat smaller fish. So kind of weird that they're like the smallest one of the lot, but they tend to eat some of the bigger food um, just because their mouth actually lets them do it. And uh, because they tend to eat these little minnows, these tiny little fish, um, they tend to spend a lot more of their time near water that is flowing. And so you'll find these guys a lot of the times if you're uh, near like stream or river where they inlet into the lakes, that tends to be where you find these guys. They're basically hanging out, waiting for whatever gets pushed out of the stream to, to come to them, basically. And so, um, again, these guys tend to be one that you're not going to encounter nearly as much. Like I said, just throwing a bobber off the dock because they sort of have this specialized like fish eating thing that they do. Um, but still one that, you know, if you spend, spend much time fishing, you'll encounter these guys. Um, on some level, and a lot, a lot of you guys have probably caught them and not even known it because, like I said, they look so much like the pumpkin seeds. Um, I'm sure uh, you also encounter these guys uh, as hybrids a lot of the time, or at least credit them as being hybrids a lot of the time, because again, they sort of share some features in common with both the bluegills and the pumpkin seeds. Um, like I said, I'm sure there, there's a lot of the times when I'll catch one of these guys and like it's not like super clear which one it is and I'll just be like yeah it's probably one of the hybrid ones and toss it out but who knows maybe it's a green sunfish. Um, like I said trickier trickiest one to identify because it sort of shares features between the other two in a way that can be complicated like I said especially given how much these guys hybridize with one another. Um, and then, like I said, as far as fishing with them, same type of deal. I'd say you're probably more likely to snag them with a minnow than you would the other two, but it honestly, like, if you're taking the time to, like, hook up a minnow onto a hook and try and cast for it, you're probably not really looking for these guys. I don't know anybody who fishes specifically for green sunfish. Because, um, one, they're little, like, so you're probably not eating them just because they're not really big enough for it. Um... And as far as like the actual like sport fishing end of it, like fishing for bluegills, you're going to have a lot more success with it. It's going to be a lot easier to set up and it's going to be a funner experience like fishing for them. Um, I said interesting fish, one that a lot of people honestly don't even really know exists around here, to be honest, I find. Um, like I said, I grew up just calling pumpkin seeds sunfish, and then it was like later in life that I learned like, oh yeah, there's actually three of these things that we see every once in a while, and these ones are the actual sunfish. So that was like a cool thing to learn like a little bit later in life, but like I said, it's one of those things where uh, I fished a lot in my life and probably didn't know until I was 15 that I was actually catching three different species rather than just two. 
and a bunch of hybrids. So I think I didn't put another slide after this. I think this is the end of it. But like I said, the kind of shtick with this is we're going to be highlighting a bunch of different species over uh, the course of the next several weeks here. Um, I'm probably going to keep kind of clumping them into groups together. And so I think next week what I'm going to be doing are uh, the... How do I want to phrase this? The other sunfishes, the, the untrue sunfish, we'll call them, since these are the true sunfishes. And so sunfish is a term that exists in biology, so there's groups of fish called sunfish that exist in biology. Um, and it's a much more expansive group than like what people typically consider to be, you know, what we typically like call sunfish. It's a much bigger group than that. And so it includes things like bass and crappies, uh, rock bass would all be included in a larger sunfish group as well. So I think that's who I'm going to highlight next week. We'll have a, we'll do a, a, a four-way one next week with largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, uh, black and white crappies, and then rock bass. So I guess a five, actually, will be the, the name of the game next week. So thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you for a couple of questions I got there. Um, and we will be seeing you next week.